The following is a conversation with Anila Hussein, co-founder of the global fashion brand Shanans. Today we discuss the equality of men and women in Pakistan, the role of agency in empowerment, and much, much more. I'm Bashir, and this is the EBBF podcast. And now, dear friends, here's Anila Hussein. You founded the global fashion brand Shenans. Why? Uh, Shenans is basically um, the name of two sisters. So Shanila, which is who is my sister, based in Pakistan, and Anila, uh, based in the West, in Switzerland. Uh, we created this brand sitting in my mom's kitchen while she was cooking, and we were uh, sitting watching her, seeing her dream not coming true when she was young and we wanted to become a fashion designer and to do something for herself. But being a sister of um, five other sisters, being a a mother and also uh, not be able to fulfill her dreams, uh, she told us uh, one time that we don't, I don't want you to come into the kitchen and do the cooking for the rest of your life. You need to do something for yourself. And it was just um, like that. She threw it up. And uh, my sister and I immediately said, OK, mom, so we are doing something for you and for the others who could not fulfill their dream. And uh, we know that as sisters or as daughters uh, growing up in a culture, uh, well, Pakistan, I grew up in Pakistan before getting married. Uh, it's not an easy thing, uh, like many other countries or many other cultures and societies where previously, uh, I would say uh, two decades ago, Uh, for girls to get full education or to do something out of the box and to think out of the box. Um, And I've been very blessed and lucky to have those parents who believed in us from the very start and told us one thing that uh, if anything happens to uh, financially or anything, uh, the girls would get the better education than boys because we have two brothers, two younger brothers as well. So that thing always remained in my head that our parents who wanted the girls to be um, more uh, advanced and forward looking attitudes and all. So that really helped us to understand that there there is a need and there are many girls like us who could not uh, be able to do something for themselves. So we created this uh, brand for our mother uh, and for all those who wanted to uh, be uh, to become who they want to be and be their own voices. So Shanann's is the fusion of East and West, and it's a fusion of two mindsets. It's a, it's a, it's a fusion of um, education and fashion together, uh, bridging between East and West. So we really want to touch global uh, markets, uh, bringing more women into trade and making it possible to know that it's not only just behind the walls, you can make something and just sell it for a few bucks, but you can look beyond and think beyond uh, and that's how Shanans is not only connected to two sisters and uh, one mission, but it's a larger vision of connecting uh, women globally on a scale of working with men. So bringing the gender equality so that men and women can work together. And um, the idea of having Shanans was to also become part of the foundation or the ed- ed- association that we have. Um, to not only empower the women, uh, because we know in our society how difficult it is, uh, so that if the women are readily working or would like to come, that they do not have this boundary of, no, oh, we have kids, we can't do work and all those things, so that children can also get the quality education. Um, so we do a lot of uh, grooming sessions for uh, women and for, for uh, husbands who are readily happy to help them to to come out and to work or be at home at, and work as well to make the possibilities between the house and the outside world. Uh, that's why this association uh, had been created as well. So that's why it's on a greater purpose of uh, connecting my mom as well to to her own vision, thinking that um, I, my, my world is not only in the kitchen, just cooking for others, but to do something greater for others as well. So she's on our project as well. She is looking after the creative part and other things and uh, we could took on board a lot of women um, and the best part of that was that after Shanann's was created um, uh, which is also a long story but uh, many ma- girls in our family could actually step out and could start working or could create something on their own and uh, then becoming lawyers becoming um, uh, entrepreneurs 
And also, we were the first to, in our own family, the mother's side and the father's side, to do something courageously uh, on our own without any um, investment from someone, uh, just on the tool of um, education that our parents gave us. That was the only thing we had. And we just utilized that to make it um, bigger. What are some of the challenges uh, that women face when you were growing up in Pakistan, but also today that make doing something like this so difficult? Uh, it's, it's, a, it's a very beautiful question. And actually, uh, please do stop me if I go too long, because uh, I think uh, the challenges are endless. Uh, we, I know as a girl as well, uh, I was very strong from the very beginning and I was quite rebellious at my age. Uh, being being a little wheatish skin, um, or I would say dark skin in my culture, uh, people do not uh, really take you or praise you for who you are. They don't see your inside skills. They see who you are from outside. And if you see my sister, if you must have seen her in the photo, she's a fair skin. And uh, so people do appreciate in our culture, oh, fair skin, or oh, you, you will get married easily, and all those different things. So they don't really see the, the inner skills or it, uh, the challenges that a girl mentally goes through from the childhood. And putting the extra extra pressure on their child that, uh, oh yeah, I think no one is gonna marry her. Who's... So I do come from a family where um, it had been also like that, because I was the only one in my family, uh, in my siblings um, being the wheatish skin. And I was the most sporty, so I was a an athlete. And being an athlete, uh, there were, I was always playing with boys and everything. So I got the notion of how the girl needs to protect themselves uh, in order to make the place in the athletic world um, and be sporty and uh, still cover the body, but do what you like to do, you know, uh, because we couldn't wear all these um, fitted uh, clothes and all those things. So that was one challenge that uh, why we come into Shanans is also to make things possible for everyone to look modest, to look uh, beautiful and also feel who they are from inside out and not what others are wearing. So I need to wear it. Uh, so that was uh, one part of it. And, and in these challenges grew over years when I was growing up and um, and my grandmother played a role unconsciously of bringing my um, and my inner thing down, uh, uh, like, um, she's not going to do this, she's not doing that. And the more she was doing that, the more outwardly I was coming out myself. But I could have gone down as a girl, too, because in, in, in our society, is like the more you say the girl is like they're shutting themselves down. So I'm very, very thankful to my parents that they never segregated between girls and boys. They never did any um, um, comparison. And they were always overlooking like, no, I know my daughters, they're going to do best and I believe in them. And just that those words are always ringing in my mind. My father had, it's always like a raising a girl is raising a community kind of a man. And although he was not very like um, PhDs and masters in life, but uh, he was doing his business and he, he, he knew that um, if I would educate a girl, I know that wherever she would go, she would rise and shine. And I think um, that that was something that I really, uh, since I was eight years old and I started thinking in my mind, uh, I need to do something for others because not everyone have those parents. And why my parents have given me the possibility to be in a good school, the best school in, in Karachi, Pakistan, which is in South, and not the others. So uh, education was one thing that I really wanted to work from, for my, from, from the very start. And uh, well, the Shanans come afterwards because that was that we we, we planned later. Uh, but the, the the challenges are not only uh, for your skin, uh, for your body type, also the abuse that you go through um, in your own family sometimes, and also from outside world. The men, yeah, I know that I've protected myself from different men uh, touching and uh, verbally or physically and all. And I had that courage to stand up for myself and to say never again. Uh, but not everyone can do that. And I have come across many cases after that, knowing that many girls have gone through that. So that's why I built up myself to know that uh, this is my responsibility also upon my shoulders to take this along and be the catalyst of uh, change for others or, or just um, creating the ripple effect of uh, who I am because I can't be everywhere, but I need to... Uh, be the wise for others. 
So uh, the challenge are, challenges are really endless. Um, but in the in the Western world, it's almost the same. Being an entrepreneur is not an easy cup of tea either. Uh, being a woman, you I, I live in, in Switzerland. I put up my company here, an association as well. Doesn't mean it was easy peanuts. Uh, it, it has it is still a challenge. Uh, opening a company in Pakistan, in, in UK, uh, in Switzerland, and onwards in the in UAE as well. Okay. It's always like, oh, these girls, you know, it's a hobby. And uh, well, they will shut it down soon. And, and even my own family, uh, many people said that. And we were like, bring it on, bring it on, give us more. The more they were giving us, the more we were advancing. So that we were in that kind of mindset, but not many can do it. I've seen others in my circle who have shut down their business after five, six years. So I was raising three kids um, at the same time, running my family, uh, work, um, but I knew how I need to protect my mental stability. If I knew that the challenge is coming up and I, I don't want to go into the burnout phase, I can say stop and I can take some pose and I can come back when I'm, I'm ready for it. Because I know if I go down, everything will go down. So, um, so the, the mental and the physical challenges uh, goes along with it. And I think uh, that's how I need to um, know uh, that, that they, comes from, they come from all different corners, but how I can, um, and my sister both, because she's in that part, so you can imagine she's still going through. And it's not that we are so strong that we never cry. Uh, we do cry, uh, we do uh, shed tears, but uh, some tears are for joy, some are for difficulties, uh, but we overcome them together. What was it like uh, growing up in Karachi with uh, with some of these issues like are there um, don't have to get to share personal stories if you don't want to but maybe things that you saw um, with school with just out and about that kind of represent some of these mm. issues well I'm, I'm I'm very happy to share any personal story because I'm really an open book since the start of my life and um, that's how I got uh, into contact with my husband, who is husband now, um, and uh, I, I, um, I don't know where to start from because uh, Karachi is a very cosmopolitan city. It's a small city of lights and buzzing and uh, very happening, um, and we can say that there are lots of opportunities. Uh, but it's been 77th anniversary of Pakistan this year. And in 77th anniversary, I must say that we are not advancing. For women, uh, for children, it's still a suppression. Uh, each year we think there could be something different. Oh, the change is coming. It's not the change is not coming, but it's such a minute level that I think decades will take to come that far. It's not only because of the political situation. Um, it has been for 77 years. Uh, more or less that the stories I have heard from my, you know, my ancestors. Uh, but at the same time, I think the change is coming is because we are trying to bring a change and a shift in our mindset. Uh, and now I can see more and more in my children, the way we are thinking, it's not the same as our youth now, who are completely thinking and doing this different way because of the digital era we are in. And I'm glad for that because as Asian we call ourselves Asian parents or Asian brown skin uh, parents. We have uh, learned to break the stereotypes uh, coming from that culture and applying those things to our children to see what would work. The challenges that we face in, in Pakistan uh, or in the Western world, would that be the same uh, if I do the same with my children and be the same uh, mother as my mother used to be or her mother used to be. So the challenges are not only the external challenges, the internal challenges are more because once we face our internal challenges or, or emotions, we can we can face any challenge around it in whichever part of the world we're living in. Trust me, uh, not because I'm living in the Western world now, so I have more wings and I can fly and I can say things easily. I've been the same and the, being the rebellious one in my family since uh, I was young because there was something in me that I was not agreeing to the, the, wrongful, um, the wrong side of, of story or someone's uh, lying about something because it's okay, you know, you can just pass it out and you can do things uh, beating around the bush by saying a small lie. So I was always like saying this is not correct and I'm not going to do it so I could lose my friends. 
my friends have left me. Uh, I was growing up and I was always working with uh, boys in college and university. And I was rebellious at that time with my father was, uh, no, you, you're you know, as a girl. I don't agree. You should not go to the boys college and university uh, because the other siblings didn't do that. So and I said, if you trust me uh, and because I trust myself, so you need to trust me. And then that trust was built between a parent and especially a father. And uh, so he used to come back and forth to the college and university to check on, uh, you know, if I was not going out with someone and other things. So the, the trust was being built um, profoundly and I could uh, protect myself from the college to the university and uh, sit till I got married. Um, actually, it's, it's a lot of work, profound work that needs to be done in the early childhood. I don't know if uh, you must have seen that in the education background, I'm a Montessorian as well. So the Montessorians, um, they have this um, this notion of uh, freedom within limits, uh, self-discipline, self-control, and all those tools that I've been working for 22 years has helped me in my any other project I'm running or being a parent. As a mother as well, uh, running, uh, having three teenagers, you can imagine it's not an easy task. Uh, I'm, I'm not a full-time uh, mother or a full-time entrepreneur, but bridging this between is beautiful. It's a beautiful way of saying that you have three kids or one kid. It's not difficult if you know who you are as a as a parent, as a mother, as an as an entrepreneur, whoever. Um, the, the challenges would come and go, uh, but you need to know how to prepare that environment for yourself, regardless of the culture and the society you're living in. And and this is my huge responsibility to do it now in the country I was in and the country I am in right now um, to bridge this together under the project. Did having that rebellious spirit or being assertive, standing up for yourself, did that in, uh, kind of in this Pakistani culture, did that ever get you in trouble? Yeah. Oh, yeah, <laughs> always. It starts from my own family. Uh, and my grandmother was always, always like, yeah, yeah, she's always doing that. She's always wants to do what she wants and everything. And I always used to keep my mouth shut. And I say, yeah, respectfully, yes. Thank you, grandma, that you're saying that to me. Thank you so much for thinking about me and everything. But I really want to do that. So for me, like she knew after a certain time that no matter what I say, she will do it. Because I knew that my father is standing with me. I knew that my mother would not say no to me because they trust me. But not all girls have those possibilities. The girls for honor kill, you know, they are dying for honor killing. Uh, they are dying for, uh, for little petty things or, or, or out of hunger. They are par the fathers who are killing their own daughters because they don't have money to feed them. So it's not one thing. But that rebellious thing at that time worked because the conditions were not as critical as they are now. Um, I wonder if I was being born in this period of time, it could have been even more difficult. My parents could have been more scared than they were before, because um, the, you can get abducted, uh, abducted easily. You can get raped easily. Like if I, as a girl from my own uncle, can get touched and ab not abusefully, but touched, like trying to see if I would touch her, would she say something? Um, and I'm talking about my other grandma, which is uh, my mother's mother, because I used to live a lot uh, with her during my childhood. I grew up with her as well. So I've learned a lot of things living in a bigger family, um, knowing that if something which I don't feel right, I need to say it. So that rebellious thing also occurred because uh, my parents told me one thing, that if you don't feel right about something, speak up. So that's how I could uh, uh, find the courage to be rebellious as well. Not only because the current was negative and I had to do it, it's because I was trying to find a balance between being courageous, being brave, and also uh, protective enough for myself. Why do you say that it might be more difficult or more critical today than when you were growing up? Because times have changed. Um, over the period of two decades, I would say, I, w I didn't grow up uh, having the iPhones with us. Uh, I remember when I got married and I came in 2002, I got my first Nokia. So that was a big thing for us. My husband and I, we were not communicating on and off on uh, Snapchats and TikToks and all those things, which is the hype now. And I learned to be more communicative. I learned to be more social. I learned to look into the eyes of the people and talk and could say things that I don't like it. and. Stop doing that. 
uh, or um, things that, uh, you know, uh, rather being like this, you know, you can, you know, so it was a huge difference uh, between that time and now. And I think um, all the Gen Z generations and, you know, we millennials, we could say, been, uh, 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 and I think it has to be like that because it cannot be the same. And that's why when we as parents say to our kids, you know, in our times, we used to do that. They say, yeah, moms, the time have changed now. You have to get evolved, you know, and you have to, in, in French, they say, lâcher les baskets, which means like, you know, leave my shoes alone. Like, you know, you just don't have to always repeat the same thing. So it's always a learning that from the 20 years, uh, like I'm, I'm 42 now. So uh, 21 years I've been living in Switzerland and 20 years I've been in, in Pakistan. So it's more than... Uh, two decades now that I'm here. So that's why I could really compare the two worlds, so 20 years there and 20 years here. Um, times have rapidly changed. Even in Pakistan, parents are, are, they don't know how to do parenting anymore. They have forgotten being a parent. Um, uh, so conscious parenting is one part that we are working on as well. When I say we, is me, my husband together. And um, so uh, I think um, being in the digital world has rapidly uh, impacted our life tremendously and uh, we have learned not to be social uh, and um, and communicate we don't know how to really communicate now previously we were angry we used to talk to our parents we were um, happy we could hug our parents now things are like keep some distance give us some space uh, between you know it could be our kids or, or, or the youth that I'm working around so um, it could be in a good and a bad sense. I'm, I'm very happy that things have evolved because we couldn't have learned the things that uh, our parents didn't learn the way what we are learning now. So, you know, there is a little, uh, um, I have to say, the, the bridge that we have crossed with our kids that our parents couldn't cross with us. So, yeah. What does uh, the phrase, my body is my body, mean to you? Um, well, it's very simple. My body is my body. Uh, is like, I'm confident in my body. This is who I am. This is how my skin is. This is how my body type is. And uh, I'm, I, I'm happy who I am. I just share a little story of um, my daughter when she was growing up. And I think she was eight or nine years old, uh, a girl. Uh, so she was saying, Mom, don't you feel bad that you're fat? And I said, uh, and I, I, at, at one point I was like stunned. And I said, what is she asking? And why is she saying that? Uh, because I knew as an athlete, I had a very like athletic body and everything. And after three kids, you're not the same. And I'm happy that I'm not the same. But so I just looked at her, posed for a minute. And I said, uh, yes, because I gave birth to three kids. And, and I'm happy who I am. I wanted to give this message to her that in future, if someone says something bad to you for your skin, for your body, for your gender or anything, you need to know what to say rather than like, ah, uh, I don't know. There are answers that I don't know. I say, I will look it up for you. Uh, but at that point, I said, yeah, because I gave birth to three kids. Look, I've got a belly like this. I've got my arms like that. And I'm very happy who I am. And that was a kind of a shut up call for her to know that I can't say these things to others because uh, this is who they are. So, But she got the confidence for herself that I heard later that she said, uh, like in French, when they talk to each other, they always say, well, it's like that. If you want to be my friend, so be it. Otherwise, you can find others. So it's also the message that I want to give across the way I communicate, which is um, also part of one of the Montessori tools that I use, the, the power of communication. How, tying this into, you know, what with the body, like body safety and child abuse, you've done a lot of work with that. Yeah. Could you share uh, some of what you're doing? Yes. Um, I've been doing a lot in Pakistan recently uh, with one of the centers, which is a rehab uh, for cerebral palsy in Karachi. Uh, through a friend of mine, I got contact and then I went there to do uh, trainings. Uh, I want to give all the tools to the teachers, the guardians, whoever are running it so that they can lead. I just give the, the, uh, the, the presentations and, and it's, the program is through all the songs. It's the easiest program you and I or anyone could be part of it. So I'm not holding any tag of an ambassador being a child abuse uh, for, for this and that. But it's really because it's close to me and I thought, you know, I would like to cater those people to know if this message goes across to those special needs children or children with certain disabilities or uh, mental challenges. 
if this message can go to them, then the people like us or the children like us, uh, which we call them the normalized children, uh, could also uh, take care of them. But trust me, it was much more simpler to go through them than to the ones who are like us, like who are so-called, uh, we know everything, we don't need to know. And um, so vocational training centers have been catering a lot uh, and the slums area, uh, the underserved communities, uh, where I just go and do the songs and through animations, they understand there are five basic songs that we do on the child safety. Very simple animated, those who don't have the, um, the camera animation and all, I just sing it and I just do my gestures and I ask them to come along because as an animator, uh, you know, youth animator or, or being working with Montessori children, I learn how to connect with my body and to see, you know, if they're not connecting, what should I do to turn around and get into that, um, into that message? So a KVTC center is also one of them, which are children with Down syndrome and, and, you know, interacting with them and doing the songs. And then after the program, which is an hour and a half, so uh, then I provide all the material to the training center. And if, they're, if they don't understand something that I do the Zoom calls and all. So I've been doing in all different kinds of schools, uh, vocational training centers, rehabs. And, uh, and uh, here I have tried in my own school. You would not believe it. The parents said they don't need me to give this thing to their children. And they come all from different backgrounds. I mean, you know, rich backgrounds as well. Uh, and I think this message needs to be uh, across from the very, very childhood. It's not like you, when you're a youth or you are 10 plus, you need to know. Because the abuse can happen anytime or anywhere. So, um, yeah. So it is the training, like the message that these kids are getting about you know, that idea, my body is my body. Yes, that... and no one has the right to touch it. What effect uh, have you seen this have uh, in I mean, the, the different places that you have done this training? It's a, full, it's, a, it's a feeling of fulfillment that I have done my responsibility. I have shared the message. I've brought awareness through this message, not only because... I could say no to a person who tried to uh, touch me when I was seven or eight, maybe. Not only really because of that, uh, but maybe it has impacted me somewhere because my sister has not done that. She didn't become the, the trainer of this message or something, but she has taught her children. She's doing it in a different way. But I became like the port pahol of this. Uh, and for me, it's the responsibility that as many people or as any parents I come across, I need to bring awareness through this program. I just say, listen, this is a thing. Would you like to go and have a look? And if there is something, you know, I can talk to you. Uh, some give a very positive response. Some say, yeah, but there are so many out in the market. We don't know. There's so much on the web going on. And it's a free program. Like it's been built so that anyone can access it in at least 20 languages. So it's in Urdu, English, French, Spanish, German. I mean, any language you say, more or less, it's available. So I've done it in Urdu in my country. All right. Uh, and moving from that to more education generally, uh, can you tell me about uh, Mazin Academy? Yes. Um, um, 2014, when I traveled to Pakistan um, from Turkey, I have met uh, a couple in a Baha'i uh, hall in Karachi and uh, someone told me, you know, by the way, they are working, they have a school uh, in, in one of the underserved community, um, an hour and a half from my house, uh, Malir area, which is uh, further away from the airport, Karachi airport. So I was very intrigued and I said, this is what exactly I was looking for to work with someone uh, from the Baha'i community uh, uh, on top of it. And, um, and they have a school which have almost 700 children. They're providing free education and everything. So I came across uh, that couple. They gave me a tour. They invited me to their school. I went with my siblings, uh, with my sister and a brother. And over there, of course, I have to go a little covered. I can't go in, you know, this, uh, uh, you know, in Western dresses and all. So, um, of course, I always go the, the traditional way. And uh, seeing that school, of course, touched me so much because I said, wow, this is what I was looking for, to connect also the youth from this part of the world to that uh, world that they, they come from, or I come from, or I grew up. And so Mazin uh, was the name of the eldest son uh, of this couple who had three children. So they named that school. Um, 
things have changed a little differently uh, just before COVID, uh, but I've been working uh, to create a, a community for 30 children in that room. It would be, I don't know, maybe 60 square meter, uh, but the school was huge. This was one room. And then I contacted all the possible schools in Switzerland. I went by myself. I took all the material that they were donating, um, connecting with them personally, talking to their children, asking them whatever they would like to donate. And that's how I could collect many things. Then I contacted the Fred Cargo in Geneva and I said, listen, I wanted to take all this donation stuff. Could you please give me some good price to take it back home? And they said, uh, well, somehow through contacts, I found a very good um, package and I sent it there four or five times in a row. But what I could do is like connecting all the youth. So I used the service project as well, like sorting all this material, uh, um, clothes, uh, shoes, whatever they could give us in the condition that they wanted to share, not what was leftovers and they wanted to, or not in a good condition. So we were sorting, packaging and sending involving the youth as well as a service project. And I took my children along with it as well. So they came along to help me in that project. And uh, so we, and then after receiving that like giving hand to hand, uh, not only the donated items, but setting up the entire Montessori classroom, connecting the international Montessori board from Amsterdam, uh, writing to them and asking the Pakistani Montessori board to come and um, give a little feedback to our project. So they, all the members from the Pakistani Montessori board, they came, they were super impressed with the quality of material that we have put there. And the way we are trying to uh, involve the parents, even if it's pre-education, uh, involving them so that they give something to get the value of uh, what their children are receiving. And um, um, so this is something which I thought just before COVID, so it ran, it ran for three years, but I never gave any donations to anyone, even in that school or to any couple, even though we were Baha'is and we knew each other. I never give any money to anyone. Anything was being needed. I was buying it or getting it bought and then delivering it myself. I was having interviews with parents uh, kind of to understand why do they, why, why education is important. Why do you think your children should come and work and study and why not beg at the, on the street? Because in that village, their children were also taking drugs because uh, they didn't know what to do. So they were having drugs, all different parts, and the girls were getting raped at a very young age because they were always outside. There were no roofs on the houses and also all different things were happening. So, uh, and this is about a village. So you can imagine there are tons of village in, 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 in Pakistan. So, uh, so what challenges they go through is another, on a, another level. Um, so this school was up and running. Uh, before COVID, I got to know a lot of things that happened in that, um, in that school uh, for the rights of the teachers um, and they were not being better paid because in my classroom my teacher uh, was paid well because I hired her and I told her I want to see the spark in the teachers who would like to get the training because I can pay you but I want you in five or six years of time to stand up and say I want to open up my own school I want to be like Anila to help the others so that it's not me the boss and you do the work for me I, and you're not doing it for me. We are working together. So you're working with me. So that understanding was difficult for, for that girl to, as a widow, to understand. And because she was a widow, um, she came to my school and she said, uh, Miss Anila, I'm looking for work. Um, please, can you give me work? Because my husband has passed away. And all the challenges she told me. So, uh, And it's a very easy thing. They, people can give you all the, the lies and everything just to get some money out of you. And, but there are also true cases where you will really connect to that person and you say, and you see the spark in that person. And trust me, Bashir, I have seen that that girl who has started her training Montessori um, AMI, which is an association Montessori International from Netherlands. Uh, I took full on board her training, material, preparation, commute, um, she is a full-fledged Montessori now after three, it's a third year now after becoming a Montessorian. And um, she has created the ripple effects in her own village where she stands. Before she was always like walking like this as a widow and not looking up. And now she can say that uh, those who are my, my neighbors are looking upon are me to teach their children. And this is one case in 200, uh, 22 million people in Pakistan. So you can imagine that one 
ripple effect can be how strong. And I'm, I mean, follow up with her. I meet her. Now I'm teaching her English online. So she takes English lessons with me because she did it in Urdu. So building her confidence one by one. And, um, and that's the, the one drop of, uh, you know, in the ocean is more than enough for me. I can't change the millions, but I can change one person or I can transform one person's, you know, uh, thinking or anything that I could do. So that was the Mazin Academy thing, but nothing is always coming on the golden plate. So that's where the challenge starts coming in when they saw that I'm not giving the money, when I am empowering the girls to start thinking and asking questions. The moment you start asking questions as a girl, you are bashed. You are either being out of the job or you've been told and it's happening even in Switzerland. I can tell you tons of stories at my own workplace as well. But um, in Pakistan, because it's easier, you can be more fearful. You have the fear of losing your job and work and everything. So that's what happened with her too. Um, and uh, it's a very sad thing to say that sometimes even not any community, no, no, no one is perfect. We are not perfect Baha'i as well. Uh, but we can strive to be to do things. But as soon as the money things come in, things can get corrupted. So at the moment I found out that this project is not working the way I wanted it to work in a service based uh, way, I took everything out of that Mazin Academy and I donated it to the KVTZ Center where um, they are working for the Down syndrome children. And my material is over there. Uh, but I'm right fighting for the rights of the teachers, salary and contracts and everything. So. It's been three years I'm still fighting, but now one teacher is helping me to fight for the others or getting their rights back. So nothing comes easy uh, in education as well, because when I knocked the door of the Sindh Education Foundation and tell them, listen, this is something going on, thinking that they're going to be um, happily helping me. So in front, they were always like, yeah, I know you. it's good that you're telling us and all, but they were all together. And they're still together because there is a per quota child that you receive from the government uh, to run a foundation, uh, you know, because under the name of education, many things are happening. That's why, um, you know, no, not any foundations are providing or NGOs are opening in Pakistan because money laundering and, you know, all these things are happening. So education uh, seems there are many good things are happening as well. Uh, but on my level, I would say that um, they would not let me run if I don't go undercover if I don't go things uh, slowly without highlighting on a social media or anything, um, to me, Nida, who is my team member and another AMI team members, are working on the ground level. We are working for with people at home, with uh, girls at home, without highlighting it so that they don't, their lives are not in danger. Uh, because this girl had been uh, on the verge of getting abducted twice uh, because she was work she's still working with me. So now she's in a safe place, she's working, and I'm following up with her. So it's not easy. You see, it's one girl. Imagine if I'm working with 10,000. So how much I can be back and forth. So under the name of education, um, it's it's the mindset. It's not academics. I don't work on academics. That would follow. With Neda, I have worked on her uh, self-empowerment, on her self-esteem, confidence, and that has led her to decide to become an educator. So this is the role of uh, me as a person, as an educator, to know um, where do I stand as a person and how I make that other person look into uh, herself and, uh, and talk to her before taking a decision to teach someone. So as a result of her uh, standing up and teaching and, and uh, becoming more confident, uh, was that a threat or what was, how did yes. that lead to her almost getting abducted? Yes, um, because well, the commute was one thing. Uh, anywhere you go, uh, uh, either you are uh, targeted by the people with whom you were working uh, because you stood up and you were raising awareness to amongst other teachers and all. So you've been threat, threatened a couple of times that you should stop doing that in a very simple manner. Uh, it's not good for you. You shouldn't be involving in all this. And um, so we thought like, you know, it's just a simple thing. And uh, but actually when people, uh, the men or anyone started following you and you can see that something is wrong in the buses, in the in the um, public buses or the the rickshaws, you know, this little tuk tuks, tuk tuks, why would we say like you're sitting in one. And so it's like um, you or a mobile snatching uh, or anything so that you're not in contact with the person. Like if she doesn't have a phone, I can't contact her. 
uh, like we are on contact by WhatsApp. So, uh, and she, uh, wa- because she wears uh, a dumatta to cover her head and her body, she wears a burkha so that not everyone can see every body part because they scan you inside out when you are going out uh, in that area. So, um, but now, um, even on the verge of being adopted, she still could protect herself and she could find a way to navigate herself and go in some other way and reach the school. And then she called me and then we had to find someone to bring her back to home and let her be at home for a couple of days until the situation calms down. And then she told me, uh, Miss Anila, I cannot go forward to help the others because um, I'm I'm in danger. So I cannot put her in danger. So I said, "Okay, you have done your bit. Now let me try and do my bit. Uh, so the process is very slow now. I've been contacted uh, with the counselor, with uh, the House of Justice, with uh, many things that I'm uh, in this process. It's very slow, but I'm hopeful that things would be into place um, soon and uh, we could do much more than what we can because I have a list of uh, certain um, uh, people or, 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 or people who have donated in kind and donated some funds And whatever I receive, not a big amount, but I always tell them, like, if I need for a training, for example, $500 or $5,000, so I only get that amount. And then I do that bit and I send all the reports and everything back to the people who have donated. So I don't get uh, regular funds coming in and all those things. It's that of work I do as much I can do in my capacity. And and that's it. So um, that's why this association has been created to uh, uh, to do what is needed or needful not to take the surplus and then keep on uh, adding the stress on it and uh, voila so now the second training would be starting so i'm going really in a in a process where i know i can handle it myself what would you say kind of in this situation well the underlying theme seems to me is the equality of women and men yeah Uh, what would you say is the the role of men in this in uh, mm. uh, like in achieving uh, women's empowerment and equality and safety mm. uh, for the women there. If you're talking on a broader spectrum, on a global level, I would say um, maybe not much, but I don't see on a global level. I see uh, the my surroundings. So of course, my father who has been a pillar uh, of me seeing a man helping a woman or my mother. I see my brothers and I have two brothers, two younger brothers. Uh, And after them, I see my husband. Um, My husband has been the biggest support of my life. um, And he knew what I stand for, who I am. And he supported me fully, uh, studies or my projects. Sometimes they say like, you know, la 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 la. And he, um, and it's good that he gives me critics because that always pushes me to move forward. So he's one of the, the best, biggest support. And of course, my children as well. So the, the role of men, I think many, many men have understood the, the reality that uh, the more we push women, the more they'll fo- go forward. Uh, but they also know that women can be fearful, uh, um, even in the men's world, uh, in all the in, uh, corporate worlds as well. Uh, there could be a bit of like, uh, oh, they can take our jobs or they are multitaskers or, you know, all those things. But apart from them, there are so many who are uh, very, very supportive as well. Um, they believe in the campaign he for she uh, and she for he and they are working together. Uh, so I see the people or the men that I am surrounded with or I made them help me. Um, and I would say that my father-in-law was He's a wonderful person, a wonderful father, a father-in-law, but he thought that this is not for women to do. And it's a men's job to do. But now, after so many years of me continuously doing Shanans and Association, Shanans and Association, he is uh, doing my accounting. He is he's on board. My husband is on board. Uh, there are critics, of course. I take them. But uh, he is there. He, he always praises me now for, for what I've become and what I'm doing and uh, what I've generated so far. So uh, if I go a little bit around the circle I am in, I try to tend and uh, get the support, those who are not supportive towards men. And 
that's where the real challenge is because they think that uh, oh yeah, maybe women should be doing, but not this much. Or um, maybe this is easy, but not for you. So I tend to work even more with them, not only for the people who have supported, but those who don't want to support, how to, to work around with them and uh, bring them on board together so that we, we are with together, not you are for me and I'm for you. Uh, so, um, but I've never worked in a corporate world. I've seen my husband working. I've seen my friends working and bringing all the office monkeys home and the challenges and depression and burnouts and all. And, and I think it's because it's not a service-based thing. It's, it's, we don't use those tools. And um, uh, I work in, a, in the educational um, uh, sector. And uh, in Pakistan, I know how the abuse goes with the teachers. Um, uh, qualified teachers or unqualified teachers. But in Switzerland, it's even more. It's um, uh, those who think that children are going to the schools, they don't know what the teacher goes through with the management. So it's, um, it's on a different level. But just a small story I've shared with my uh, children yesterday because I've just started a new um, consulting work uh, in a school in Montessori. I've worked for 22 years. So now I want to shift from teaching children to actually helping parents because they should be actually getting the tools, not the children, because they would be easily getting all the work done if the parents are ready. Both are working, both are tired, both are stressed. Uh, voila, all those things. So the conscious parenting is something that my husband and I, we have started working recently as a service too, as well. Uh, but then, when this didn't work, I said, okay, I'm going to start charging you for now for this work. And so that you get the value of it. But in two months, if I, you do not get what we are working together, that means I've not done my job well. So we're going to stop working. So it's not an ongoing thing for six years. It's like one month, six weeks, two weeks, and and you get the tools, you work with it. So that's what my husband does as well, because from banking to education, it took him 22 years to quit banking and come into education. And that's why I think uh, if the men believe that um, the future is education, but how we can uh, come across together uh, equally men and women, I think the change would come. It's all about our mindset. On the level of economics, there's some research that I'm not super familiar with, but I've heard about that has tracked the uh, the equality uh, and the empowerment of women with economic development and has found that it's very closely tied and there's actually a causal relationship. So as women uh, have greater rights, greater uh, participation in the workforce and just more generally that the economic prosperity of the community is compounds greatly. Hmm. Well, it does. Um, I think the role of women in the economic development is crucial, but these, these were the very heavy terms that, um, that I started learning these days, uh, maybe past decade, uh, empowerment, um, economic growth, women in trade, but these are the things we were doing from before. It's just it became more fashionable, sustainability, ethical, uh, and all those things. But this should be in everyone's um, soul. Like, this is who you should, we should be, in the, regardless of uh, where we are and what we do. Um, but in, in Pakistan, like, you know, if the literacy rate is just 34%, maybe, for women, like, how can you expect them to be in this... Uh, economic development uh, or policy makers uh, or uh, in technology and everything. But there are who are becoming the shining stars as well amongst uh, all the rest. Um, so the change is coming, uh, but it's the awareness because right now what they're facing is having no internet. I mean, if you don't have access to internet, even if you're staying at home and like, you know, in Afghanistan when the girls can't go to college, they can self learn themselves you can you know, they can study themselves but if you don't have internet uh, you know what can you do so they, they cut the access to internet as well um so that women cannot be more aware or or men i, I would not say men sorry the, the girls and boys both so it's not only i'm going towards for the girls because i am from the gender but um for men for for uh, for boys as well they've been uh, they've been abused for many senses as well the rights for boys as well being uh, waved with taken off and they are working on streets and begging and all different kinds of things. So it's uh, uh, something I think as 
from the very early start, if uh, they've been given this notion of like uh, uh, de developing your own soul, your own conscience, and when you do that, there is a development of your your society. And when you do your society, the development comes around, you know, for a greater good for your country and then the world. So like, you know, the the circle is uh, you're enlarging your own circle by creating more awareness, actually. So the economic development is not only in numbers. It's like um, if you know how to catch a fish rather than asking for fish uh, to be on your plate, you're actually <laughs> contributing to it already. What you mentioned about literacy, something I find interesting in the Baha'i faith is how the responsibility for uh, educating children to be literate is enjoined on the father. And that okay, it's, it's the father's responsibility to make sure the, the kids learn to read and write. And uh, yes. of course, we know how important that is for uh, his skills moving forward. Uh, kind of on this, um, on the topic of education, very closely tied, uh, there's the mm -hmm. question of mental well-being. So I was yeah. wondering if you could tell me about that. Yes, actually, when I would started from the country I grew up in or I was born in, I had no notion of what is mental illness. Uh, I knew there had been uh, some of the family members or friends who have gone through certain mental illnesses or depressions and other kinds of things, but it's stigmatized. You can't talk about it. There is a taboo that uh, you can't talk about you're, 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 you're sick or you're going to a psychiatrist. Going to a psychiatrist is a stigma in our country, in our society, in our culture. Now it's open and people are talking about it. Going to the psychologist is like going to any other doctor. Um, so this is something... Uh, when I grew up, I knew there were people, oh, she's sick, oh, she's not well, and she's doing some crazy stuff. So she's, we call it in Urdu, Pagale. she's crazy. So we used to laugh at that because we think that it's a funny thing to say someone she's crazy or he's crazy. But then at one point, when you see the gravity of that person is continuously doing the same thing and he's not getting the help of it for it, it is not something usual. It's not something common. Like um, here, many of them are taking a misuse of being uh, sick as well. Uh, that's another story. But as I was growing up, I could understand that uh, it can be because everyone has a different capacity of taking things in, you know, from the outside world, in-house, uh, family life, social life. Uh, uh, peer grouping, um, you know, peer pressure and everything. Because I had this beautiful surrounding of my parents who protected me from different angles, giving me the freedom. Not everyone had that. And I could see my friends were going through depression, but I didn't know what that word is. Why? And, and I didn't even Google that word because I didn't know if it existed. So I was, I was always saying, yeah, don't go close to her because she's crazy and she can do some crazy stuff or he can do some crazy stuff. And then after getting married or going to different directions uh, for education or universities and all, you do forget. You don't think about that you need to do something uh, for it. So the, 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 the mental, uh, I mean, it's not only because of uh, abuse or uh, uh, less literacy. Um, there's a lot of pressure uh, that men or women girl or a boy, child, uh, go through because uh, things have escalated to another level of uh, uh, poverty, richness, materialism, con consumerism, and everything is like, like when I go to Pakistan now, I really feel I want to be out of it. I can't carry a Louis Vuitton bag. That means I'm not in the same group. So they see me that I come from Switzerland, so I need to have something you know, even though they don't ask me, but I feel that pressure that I need to have that. So I, I, but I know that I don't have it and I don't want it. And if you don't want to be my friend, I'm very happy. Chapter close. Uh, but not everyone can do that. So it's like, you know, consumerism, materialism, buying it and all those things. So mental illness comes through that as well. You need to, you know, balance uh, everything. And then I see a lot in youth these days as well. Uh, parents, have different work lifestyle, uh, different things. 
uh, the youth are unable to communicate with them. Children are unable to communicate with them. Um, we are not perfect parents as well. We are still sort of striving as well to learn a lot from them. Uh, but the youth around us, that's why we feel as a responsible parents as well, to work with youth more and more to understand their needs. Um, and uh, um, there are uh, lots of um, you know, psychiatrists and psychologists who are also serving in that sector now and bringing more awareness, but some are making it very fashionable. Oh, we're going to a psychologist because of very petty things. Uh, but really, every, every case is different. Um, uh, and I am more towards raising the awareness of that if you feel something is happening to your body or, or you're taking it too much on yourself, what are the things you should be doing, where you should have this uh, little um, detachment, uh, feeling of detachment that you need to work on, rather than what I need to have or what I don't need to have. So very simple. I'm not a psychologist either. I'm not into this field of, uh, you know, um, but raising awareness is because I've gone through a lot. So I think I feel that I can I can do some something. Have you seen uh, some of these issues manifest uh, at Shenan's or like with the workers? Because that's a different context of uh, in working versus like the social environment. Yes. Uh, I, well, I would say it starts from us because, uh, you know, the pressure when you take as girls that uh, you can't do this and you can't do that is already, um, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, a stigma on you that the girls can't do that. So the pressure comes in, but then you deal it differently because at our times were maybe more different than, than now. But the, pressures, the pressure or the challenges have increased with the time, so it's even double now. We think that it's, it, has been, it has been lessened or it will be, but, but the only thing that I can, I can say is like uh, through Shanann's, uh, which has the greater mission of uh, you know, combining, uh, bridging the gaps of uh, you know, education, fashion, me, uh, you know, illness, mental, mental stability, uh, conscious parenting uh, that comes along because the, the one thing that I always keep in mind being uh, part of Shannon's is positive thinking, sleeping healthy, and detaching uh, and eating healthy. So uh, with the resources I have. So when, uh, when I combine these three elements, I know when my body would say stop and I would stop. Uh, I know the people who are working with us and if they're unable to join the workshop because of XYZ reason, uh, we understand that we need to trust them and there are people who can abuse as well. But there have been people with us for a long time now because they know what we believe in. And there have been times we were unable to pay their salary because we didn't have enough means. Uh, and we said, listen, there will be times that we would be unable to do that because we are not getting our salaries either or for any reason. So they've been on board with us. They stick with us and they are with us. That means they believe in what we do and they trust us. So the, the, the solidarity of being together, we are a very small team, uh, but we take care of each other. If one is sick, like one is going through some, uh, some cancer right now. Uh, so we are working on, on, on that family and providing some, you know, so whatever we can do in a capacity, we, we, we can, but we can't change their circumstances, what they are going through with, within their own household or, you know, other things. Um, so this is something which um, uh, we are conscious about. How would you say that Shenan's has uh, aided with um, creating goodwill, but also freeing um, freeing women from social injustice? We're not yet there, uh, but we are. We have taken huge steps uh, towards making that little difference. Uh, I could just count on my fingertips uh, the number of women we have worked with. Uh, I can count on uh, the projects we are working on. Uh, my sister, who is a co-founder of Shenan's, uh, she had been working in rural areas and doing things out of scrap in their own houses because they don't have enough means. So, OK, whatever you have, we're going to work on that. Uh, and then we could see um, that the breaking chains, the you know, like untying themselves in a in, in a uh, on a level where they think like there are no chains, and like you're untying in it in your mind, uh, is actually the the, the, um, the the fulfillment of 
how we see ourselves because we know that the chains that we had around us we had broken them ourselves uh, and 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 them who are uh, who think that uh, if we are with them they are able to do it but when we are not with them uh, who would support them uh, yeah but my husband doesn't let me do it or my in-laws don't let me do it and all um uh, because i remember and i know that my sister when she had started doing her uh, fashion designing course uh, she had shared that at ebbf as well um it was not that because she was married in a rich like so called well off family and everything but she had to lie to join the fashion uh, industry because she was not uh, supposed to work or study after getting married so if she had done that and after a couple of years she had to um uh, when she got the gold medal being a gold medalist uh, fashion designer she had announced that the challenges she had gone through to come this far paying the fees and everything uh, you know we supported each other on that so it's um it's something which um, it's it's a it, i cannot explain that in words like how how it could be until unless you you see it and you feel it yourself so your sister she did she go to fashion school was that in secret yes uh, like the yes. expectation was that after she got married yes like okay she's at home yeah she was yeah. 19 when she got married uh, i was 21 as well and then a year after she she had a baby so she was 20 and uh, she had couldn't finish her uh, graduation uh, she always wanted to to the husband didn't say that you don't have to study but the in-laws were not very eager that she should work or study now she's married and all the household stuff and all those things but um somehow i was sitting with her one time when i went to pakistan uh, after getting married as well and i said well, what about you what if something goes wrong to your husband with your husband who are you where are you standing how can you support yourself um because i knew my husband was very supportive and he pushed me to st- to learn and to study and uh, and i said the same should be with you because we we grew up in a family where our parents let us do it so why aren't you continuing and you have that eagerness to do it he said i don't have the money i can't do it, i don't earn and everything so we supported financially each other we didn't take it from our parents i didn't take from my husband either we supported financially so she got the admission in one of the best uh, fashion designing college university in pakistan So she used to say to her in-laws that she going to meet her friends but she was going to university to study and um after 2 years they got to know her husband got to know later in the lives she supported he's a very gentle man but he's always bound with the family rules and everything so um, and he he's he's my best friend he I love him so much he's my beautiful brother-in-law uh, but of course you know in the society you don't have the choice as a man as well sometimes to decide uh so i was pushy i was a, i'm there with you don't worry i stand with you and and we she did it so after 4 years she completed her fashion designing and uh, and all the in-laws were standing with them she's my daughter in law and all she said oh oh <laughs> you didn't support me when i wanted <laughs> so yeah and now she has a huge respect in her family and she opened doors for so many women in her uh, in her in-laws uh, in the extended in-laws family as well and they all regard her Uh, and they come to her to seek advice uh, as a designer and everything so she has traveled across a uh, lot with me for many um fashion shows and everything and 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 trust me for sure we i think even the fashion world we think that we need money to do everything i landed on the london fashion week with just hashtagging women empowerment can you imagine on instagram <laughs> and i landed twice and uh, we, we did a ramp and, uh, and twice uh, there and we uh paris and cannes and all is pure connections that we had created and are authentic ones and they do make a difference i think that we uh, yeah i just can't explain <laughs> what do you think it is about you or your sister that has like why do you think that you have the agency to do this when so many haven't uh, i don't know i don't know It's beautiful you asking me this question. I think it's um it's the way um my parents created that environment for me. Um uh, because my mother was the fifth sister in her um parents uh you know in, in grandparents. And she wasn't very educated when she got married. She did her ninth or 10th grade because at that time ninth grade was a big thing too as well. Uh, my father as well um wasn't too much but he was running his own business. and uh so this is something which i think uh, has 
um, given us, maybe it's, it's inborn, I don't know. But I have worked on that for years on the quality of detachment more that I learned about becoming a Baha'i because in 2007, I became a Baha'i. I come from a Muslim family, of course. So also telling that them being a Baha'i, uh, the unity in the family and everything and the actions speak louder than words. It's not about uh, I'm a Baha'i, you know, the unity of the religions, the unity of mankind is the most important thing. But being a Muslim, I had this thing as well in my mind. It's just a transformation of, of thoughts and the journey that I am in right now. My, my siblings are not Baha'is. My, my grandfather was a Baha'i, but we were not supposed to talk to him about the Baha'i faith. But it was because of him I got hold of uh, the Baha'i family and the hall, Baha'i hall in Pakistan and all those things. So I truly believe that you're, we need to work uh, immensely on, the, on our confidence. Um, and uh, I don't know if I've told you, but the story of coming to Switzerland after getting married uh, was also a journey because my husband was not well and he was in the, some depression phase and everything. Uh, um, it was not his choice, but because of his work and everything. And he thought that I shouldn't be getting married and ruining someone's life uh, and bringing her to Switzerland. And I told her, I told him that uh, he's two years older than me. And I said, what if I get married to someone else? And if he is sick after, will I leave him? Uh, will I not love him? And um, so, you know, something was more beautiful and more powerful than just getting married and, you know, being with each other. We did. Something the Baha'i writings mention, I believe this is from Gleanings, is that every soul is endowed with uh, the ability to reflect um, the qualities and attributes of God. But, um, I remember reading that like, each individual soul has a unique makeup and naturally has uh, different levels of different qualities. and often there's one that shines above the rest. So like sometimes uh, you go out and you meet someone who is just, they're so radiant. Or someone who, like their, their defining quality is truthfulness, that they will not tell a lie ever. And uh, through this conversation, through these stories, it seems to me that uh, for you, that's agency, that doing things because you you can, not because you were told to, or someone said you can't, like, okay, well, I'll do it anyway.
Well, it, I think it, it's so it's so important because there's so many social forces out pulling in this direction and that, and you've mentioned a few, uh, like just seeing you know consumerism and materialism, and how that manifests, or uh, just kind of what you described with how how people's even just their ability to communicate has changed as a result of uh, the online world, where having spaces where people can can talk and discuss and I mean, it's that like you wouldn't think that people would be interested in that but they are it's like people are are clamoring for connection for uh, this higher level like i i was in um well, i was in an uber a, a week or two ago and i was chatting with the driver and we had just the most wonderful conversation about uh, well he was telling me about pickleball playing that and getting his friends involved uh, but then it, it kind of turned to some of these higher level themes about the material world and the spiritual and the idea that we are spiritual beings in a material world and it, he said it just really resonated with him and I mean it's something that he said that struck me is that it's like yeah um people don't talk in the uber <laughs> I think that just taking that taking that leap uh just saying hey, tell me about yourself or like overcoming any barrier to talking to oh I'm going to uh secretly go to fashion school that it uh it, it requires what what's been a theme of this conversation which is agency so i think this is just the call to to be mindful of that and to to do the things that maybe are uncomfortable that uh sometimes are quite difficult so i think that that's a great place to end end this and i want to say thank you for sharing all your insights all your stories you know, about this <laughs>